Hi, Misha here. And recently I published an update video. I kind of entitled it Labor Day Black Box. But it was really just me relaxing at the end of the day, trying to get tired after everything was done, you know. And I'm doing the same now. Just kind of settling down before bed. I tend to be more of a night person. My mind just kind of works that way. And one thing I mentioned in that video was about new Star Trek series. Be it the J.J. Abrams films, Discovery, Picard, or even Lower Decks. And what I'm about to say really would extend not just to Star Trek, but a lot of new series. But not all of them. For example, Star Wars The Mandalorian is one that it definitely would extend to. Maybe even more so than Star Trek. But yeah, one thing I alluded to in that video was that I'm not a big fan of most of the new Star Trek stuff. While well, some of my reasons might kind of fall into lockstep with a lot of the dissatisfaction, we'll call it, on the internet. Truthfully, some of it's just vehement, blind, pointless hatred. But of course, for me, the way I consume media is uh, um, an auditory, not visual. And yeah, not, not to, you know, put a point on it, and I want to be very clear, this is not a complaint video, this isn't me whining, that's it's not my thing, I have a, a good life, and obviously I read a lot, and that's fine, but it does change my perspective. So I wanted to talk about watching new Star Trek, and by extension, new series, for people like me that are blind, or maybe others out there that have low vision to the point they really can't see, but I, I'm totally blind, so going from that. The newer shows are extremely visual oriented. So, let's take the original Star Wars trilogy. Obviously, it was well regarded praised even for its visual effects. And there are a lot of visual effects that happen in that, no, no doubt. However, the pacing is such, and the dialogue is such, and the characters are acted in such a way that even not seeing the screen, it's pretty easy to follow, especially with maybe a second viewing. The same could be said for the original Star Trek series. <laughs> in fact, I think in some instances, not seeing what happens on screen might make it better. <laughs> um, <laughs> the original motion picture film had its moments. It was boring for me when it was those long scenes that I couldn't see. But on the other hand, the, the score, the music was outstanding. And there were also a lot of dialogue scenes. Now, Wrath of Khan, that was very easy for me to follow. A lot of dialogue, and that's pretty much what it was. Even when the ships are shooting at each other, I get it. Shoot, uh, this ship shoots, that ship shoots. They, they very much call out what's damaged and what's going on. It's maybe one of the easiest films for me to follow. Really, really is. Uh, Star Trek 3, 4 also good. I mean, Star Trek 4 is very dialogue heavy. Um, Star Trek 5 exists. Moving on. Star Trek 6, yeah, another good dialogue heavy. There are some visuals in it, but yeah. And then you get into the next generation. The original series there, of course, was a little more updated, a little more visual going on, but still a very dialogue, very drama-driven series. So, with those, I never really had to ask for a friend or family member to kind of be narrator. Now, they have done in the past, on some films, basically narration films. And what they would do there, they would pause the film 
and then a narrator would describe a scene. And they would keep the music or something, the background noise going, so it wasn't as jarring as you might uh, might think. Basically kind of turning a film into a, a, an audio play or audio book. But those are pretty few and far between, and typically it was more classic movies, more movies that the copyrights and everything were less on. Well, beginning with the Next Generation films, this became harder for me, and for obvious reasons. The Next Generation films were much more action-heavy. That said, they still had some good dialogue. Even Generations had good dialogue. First Contact, actually. Um, my friends took me to the theater when First Contact came out for my birthday. Because it pretty much came out right around, I mean, right on my birthday. So, great, you know, I had a great, great time, you know, with four or five friends, and, yeah. So, really the only of the Next Generation films that was a little hard for me to follow was Nemesis, but that's because, as much as I love the actors, and I really didn't even mind the concept, and I really love Romulans, that plot was kind of a hot mess anyway, and I think it confuses a lot of people, so I'm not sure if it's me being blind or the film just kind of being a hot mess. It's a shame, too, because from what I've heard, it originally started off as a halfway cohesive script, but I digress. Um, Enterprise, the series, again, relatively easy for me to follow, although there were more drawn-up scenes where basically the only thing I knew was going on was literally pew-pew, pew-pew, and pew-pew, and then boom, boom, so it was a little hard for me to follow the happenings, but usually at the end of the episode or the next episode, they, they would kind of describe what was going on. But then after four years of you know, Star Trek 2009 and the J.J. Abrams film happens. Now first off, I want to say a positive. I am actually pretty thankful I wasn't able to see the J.J. Enterprise. Uh, eventually I knew what it looked like thanks to the Eagle Moss models. Or maybe I should say um, regrettably because I'm not sure if I should be happy or pissed at Eagle Moss for letting... But I, I'm not really a fan. <laughs> and that's where we see this trend. The newer shows are more action driven. This is a simple fact. But unfortunately, the pacing is just up, 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 up. It's like first they started off with cocaine, then they put Adderall on top of it, and then they drank a bunch of caffeine on top of that, and then they did more cocaine and Adderall. They get faster and faster and faster, and they never slow down to really talk. And the dialogue goes from being true dialogue, where, where people are talking paragraphs in a script to literally one-liners. Just like a whole series of one-line little quips, little movie quips. And of course, more explosions, more fighting, more and more fast-paced, more special effects. But that was the, that, those were movies for um, the, the first one and then Into Darkness. So I was hopeful when Discovery would come out that it maybe it'd kind of be more of a return to form. I knew that it would be more special effects driven. That's just the modern time. I fully accept that. that that's okay. I mean, one of my favorite series was uh, the re-envisioned uh, Battlestar Galactica, and that, that's pretty action-heavy. I think anyone would agree. But um, I still very much enjoyed it and able to follow it. So I'm not a prude, and I don't expect or even want the world to cater to me. That would be very boring for the 99.99% .99 of you out there that can see it. I don't wish that. You know, and that's, that's fine. But it is nice to be included. Unfortunately, Discovery doubled down. And Picard doubled down. Which is kind of weird, considering... Picard is about an 80-year-old man. I was hoping it would be more calm and introspective. Some parts were, but a lot of it was very frantic-paced, very uh, visual. And here's another odd thing I notice. With the old characters, the way they delivered dialogue, 
the way they spoke, the words they said, how they said them, the nuances to the characters. I could hear a character's voice and very quickly identify them as, hey, that's Zulu. Hey, that's Jordy. Hey, that's Data. Hey, that's uh, Tucker. Or Archer. To Paul. They were easy. Sometimes I had trouble determining when Mayweather was speaking, but to be fair, I think that is a problem with the show, not with me. But being serious, yeah, the, the, the way the actors delivered their lines and the lines they were given, I could easily know who was talking. I found with a lot of newer shows, Star Trek included, I have a harder time. Close your eyes sometime and listen to how, maybe not the main, main characters, but the secondary characters want to deliver their lines and how their voices sound. They're very homogenous, at least compared to the old school way. I mean, you listen to the original series, the way the characters speak, even the secondary characters, is very distinctive, and maybe not perfect, but very distinctive. The new, the new characters, I, I, it takes me longer to tell who's who, and I still get them mixed up. Now, another part of it is, too, because they don't sit there and talk for extended periods in a quiet environment. They're, they're spewing one-liners in a very noisy, very cluttered environment. And that's another thing. The newer shows, sometimes the music, to me, is a little overly loud. It's not very subtle. It's very big and bombastic at times. And also, there's so much noise going on. If it's not guns firing, it may be explosions or engines. There's so much other distracting noise. There's never hardly scenes like in in the, the Next Generation was maybe best at this. Of just a quiet conversation in a conference room with just a background hum of the engines. Just a, a nice, calm, very easy to hear environment. I, maybe that's just me, but the newer stuff, it, it, it's just it's a bit of auditory overload sometimes, but I wonder if that has to do with me not being able to tell some characters apart now. But I also have to wonder if it's just that characters are more picked and based around their visual appearance. Yes, how attractive they are, but also just how they look, be it their costumes, hairstyling, whatever, and less about the dialogue, the literal character put into them. I mean, one of the most memorable things about the original series was how some of the characters spoke, be it Spock or McCoy or Kirk or Scotty. And yes, the writers wrote them that way, but the actors really brought those roles to life. I mean, I really think we wouldn't remember Chekhov and Sulu if the actors, or even uh, Ahura, if the actors themselves hadn't brought a something special, something unique, some gusto to them. You know what I mean? And I don't know that newer actors do that. And I'm not blaming them. I'm sure they were very talented people. But I have to wonder if it's the, the directing now and the, the expectations. And also the fact that every show is done by committee with 20 producers, executive producers, that everyone's trying to just put their thing in it. I just, I don't know. I, I, I'm not saying I know an answer. I'm just giving an observation, if you know what I mean. So it makes it hard for me to follow. And also the plots. Don't get me wrong. And one day I'd like to go through that next generation and really talk about how many plots were derivative, how many were recycled, how many were just boring, like the child. But the fact is, The Next Generation had 26 episodes per season, so they could have some clunkers. In fact, that was kind of par for the course. No one expected every episode to be the best, as long as it was okay. And as long as every four or five episodes we got a good one, you know, one a month, we were happy because it, you know, 26 episodes, that still means you got seven, eight, nine good episodes a season, which is basically how long a season is now. 
And that's what, another thing. The, the modern seasons. Let's just say we're still doing um, episodic television. A modern season has just gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. It went from 26 to 24 on many shows and then down to 22 for many shows and then to 18 over the years and then to 13 and now a lot of new series especially in Trek are 10 episodes a year and sometimes not even that back in the day it was every year there would be a new season assuming it wasn't cancelled now you might have a one or even two year gap in between seasons and the same thing could be said for films. I mean, look at the, the J.J. films. I think one of the key factors that stalled them out was how slow they were to put them out. I mean, they did uh, 2009. And it was a success. And I think if they had come out with the sequel in 2011 or even 2012, kind of carrying that momentum on, but they, they waited until 2013 to make the first sequel. And then this, the third one came out in 2016, barely. The only reason it made it was really the pressure to get it out for the Star Trek anniversary. So, in, uh, you know, in, in seven years, actually more than seven years, closer to eight, truthfully, we got three films. Now go look at the original films between 1979 and 1989 we had five films and four of them were actually okay three of them were good one of them had its good points and one of them had Kirk fighting God so that that happened but yeah five films in ten years versus barely three films in nearly eight years and those were five films that an already established cast that we had known on TV for 70, what, six episodes, 78 episodes. You're trying to reintroduce the cast with only three films. And they, they're not ever given time to breathe, to really get to know them, to get to care about them. And that's one thing that really annoyed me. A lot of the stuff that happened in the current films didn't feel earned. By that I mean in the first film, Kirk went from being an insubordinate cadet, which okay, I'm fine with, to being captain. That bugged me even when I saw it. Not enough to get outraged and care. It was just ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, it'd be one thing if he was maybe a lieutenant and got promoted to commander than captain. I'd accept it, it, it in, in the sense of theater. It's not realistic in any sense of the word, but okay. But to go from cadet to captain, and with his record on top of that, is... Man, that, that's even preposterous by Michael Bay standards. It really is. I'm not even going to get into Kirk's characterization and how... The Shatner Kirk was pretty well by the book. I will say that the actors did good in the show as far as it was, and the music was very good in 2009. I do see positives in it. I went with friends to it, to the theater. In fact, it was the second to last film I ever went to a theater on. And I liked that they, that they thought enough to have Pike in there, and of course it was good to see Leonard Nimoy. So I'm not going to say it was completely valueless, but... I will say that In the Darkness basically was. The whole thing with Khan was not earned. And the whole thing with Kirk's death, quote-unquote, at the end, and Spock's reaction was not earned. We had no sense. We, we, we knew that they were companions, colleagues, but we didn't... It, there was, it didn't earn that reaction from Spock. And then, of course, likewise, by the, um, the third film, which was, had its moments, too. In fact, I think in some ways it was the best and most authentic. 
And I did like some of the references tossed in, like the, the hand in space type thing. For one thing, Kirk bemoaning being captain after only, what, three, four years in the show? And considering being an admiral was, was silly. I mean, at, at this point in the timeline, what, what was it, like 2364? You can tell I don't research these before. This is just late night ramblings. At that point, Kirk had, need, had not even made captain in the original timeline yet, much less been offered Admiral. And again, keep in mind his records. Technically, he never even graduated from Starfleet. People want to talk about Wesley Crusher and his stuff, but nah, he got nothing on J.J. Uh, Kirk. And again, I don't have a problem with the actor, but yeah. And of course, the problem, I think the main problem with the third film beyond was the underlying plot the bones were just kind of very unoriginal very derivative another big bad guy and yada yada i really think they could have done better with a more authentic more intriguing plot because a lot of the other writing was okay if not spectacular and then to have the enterprise destroyed again not earned the reason it mattered in Star Trek 3 is we had known that ship for nearly 20 years at that point. Three years of the original series, two years of the animated, and two full films. And even then, it is destroyed towards the end of the third film. It felt earned. Plus, the way it went out was pretty cool with the Klingons and the self-destruct and... And the fact that Kirk was able to do that after just losing his son, I, I think Star Trek Three is, is very underrated. I think the, the final act is a little weak, but the first and the second acts I, I really enjoyed. But then again, that was one of the first Star Trek films I saw. The first one I saw was Star Trek Two. But um, anyway, that was just the time when I was young. And you, you see that a lot with newer Star Trek series, too. They really want their cake and to eat it too. They want you to feel things for characters without actually investing the time into writing the characters and letting you experience maybe even bland or mundane plots with. I mean, most of season one and even some of season two of Next Generation was kind of crap. But what it did do was it gave us tons of little character moments they would carry over. I mean, Tasha Yar is a great example. She was not in very many good episodes, but she became a, a fan favorite because she was there. And plus, she helped inform Data's character and a little bit of Worf's and so on. But having seven seasons with over two dozen episodes per season really let us know the Next Generation cast and thus Picard. But then the Picard series actually spends pretty little time focusing on Picard himself, at least comparatively so. And Discovery, I personally, and this is just a personal opinion thing, I, I think the Star Trek ensemble cast is a good thing, but I will admit, the original series was not originally built around an ensemble cast. It was essentially Kirk and Spock from the beginning, and then McCoy got more and more time, and Scotty got some. But really, if you think about the original series, it was two to three main characters with uh, three or four supporting characters. It wasn't until Next Generation we really got a true ensemble cast, but it worked, so we carried it over with DS9, and we carried it over with Voyager, although they really leaned heavily on a couple of characters in their later seasons, but still technically ensemble. And I personally don't like the decision to get away from that with Discovery, but I fully recognize that's just personal. You know, so other people might. That's totally fine. It's a subjective opinion type thing. So yeah, as I was saying a while ago, <laughs> 10 episodes a season. And that wouldn't even be so bad if they were standalone episodes, but they're not... They are serialized. Instead of being episodic, they're serialized, meaning one informs another. Even when they did kind of a, a season-long arc, 
in Enterprise for season three, they still deterred. They had uh, what twenty four? Yeah, twenty four episodes in season three. Yeah, most of them were dedicated to the Zindi in one way or the other. Some of them directly, some of them kind of tangentially, but others were just their own plot, like the one where they found the Wild West town, or the one where they find the, the second generational enterprise, or even, to some extent, the episode, excuse me, episode Twilight, which, yes, it's related to the Zindi, but not really the overall arc. The Zindi are just a backdrop, and that's usually rated as one of the best in the, se in the season, for sure, and maybe series in general. They they knew when to focus and when to back away. Deep Space Nine did this even more. I mean, the Dominion War... I mean, they built the Dominion up from Season 2 onward. And even with the last two seasons when the war was happening, they made sure to, to let it breathe, to give you either fun episodes or adventure episodes or, or mystery episodes or whatever in between the, the military episodes. You know what I mean? I don't see that. And, and really, to be fair, when you only have 10 episodes a season, that's hard to do. It's hard to have a, a season-long arc. But, yeah. That's the nice thing when you had 18, 24, or even you know, 26. Now, again, they're not all going to be good at that point. You're going to have some clunkers, because that's a lot to write. But if you do a 10-episode se season, and it's kind of all one big plot, it is easier to write. You just chop it up. And you know who else has always done that? What used to be kind of be considered the lowest form of ed entertainment? Daytime soap operas. And I'm not going to insult new Star Trek by calling it a daytime soap opera. But they're getting closer. The way they have these over-the-top dramas, uh, character conflicts, and kind of this just ongoing plot that is intriguing at some times, but the payoff just never seems to be what you hoped. You know, you ever notice that with these big plots? Very rarely is the payoff is grand or the mystery is intriguing or deep as you as you thought it was. I will give credit, Deep Space Nine wraps up the Dominion War, very satisfactory. And uh, the end of season three, except for the whole Nazis and time thing of Enterprise, was satisfactory. Even good. But I don't know. I really don't. I don't know many people that were happy with the end of season two of Discovery. Mm, I've heard a little more mixed about the end of Picard. Mm. But, you know, Star Trek was always best when you had a lot of standalone episodes. I think in that sense, Enterprise hit a good balance, as did Deep Space Nine. There was good continuity in Enterprise. They, from the very beginning, referred to prep past events, even if it was just in, in passing. They brought back, they had a lot of reoccurring characters. But they had plenty of standalone episodes or loosely connected episodes. They, they balanced it very well with those. I kind of wish Voyager had been more Deep Space Nine style, but Voyager went the other way. They, they still had some arcs, and they still had some things, especially early on. But that episodic format versus serialized, as a general rule, seems to serve Star Trek better. Now, when you're doing a new series like Discovery, if you want to go more of a serialized thing, great. Do it. Try it out. But something like Picard, at his age, they, I'm not saying do full fan service. That's never fun. But it would have just been nice to have more of a TNG reunion. Because that's what everyone... I mean, people like Picard a lot. But people also really liked a lot of the other characters. Heck, a lot of people would have even liked to see Wesley come back at this point. Crazy, I know. But... <laughs> He's alright.
he kind of got a bit of a bad rap in my opinion, but yeah. That's the problem though when you're building on what's already come before. When, when you're blank slate, you can kind of do your own thing, but if you want to benefit off of a property's pre-existing notoriety, you also have to pay homage to that. You can't just say, okay, I want to benefit from everyone loving Star Trek, but then do my own totally different thing. It doesn't work that way. And that's kind of a problem with Star Wars. And, uh, yeah. Hmm, I don't know. Speaking of, yeah, as is, is, is hard as some new Star Trek is for me to follow, imagine Mandalorian. Not much dialogue going on there at all. Uh, I, I really don't even try, I'll be honest, I haven't seen much of it at all. And that's fine, I'm, I, I don't, kind of much like how Star Trek is maybe best as a series, Star Wars is movie stuff. That said, I actually did like the Clone Wars more than I thought. Um, granted, the first time I saw the Clone Wars, I was, um shall we say, in an altered state of mind on vacation. And leave it at that. <laughs> Made it interesting, though. Kind of a similarly to Mandalorian Lower Decks. I know a lot of people are liking it, and that's that's cool. And the, the references were kind of neat. I, I can see them getting old quickly, though, if that's all that it does. But it's it's a very frantic pace, and trying to keep up with it, frankly, it gives me a headache. I don't like super fast-paced things, as you can tell. I'm more of a long-form person. And that's really not anything to do with me being blind. That's just my personality. I like nuance. I like detail. That's why I was a historian. That's why I really like digging in deep and spending time. I like having long one-on-one -on -one chats with people. I don't like going to, to clubs and meeting 500 people in one night. You know, different strokes. Again, I'm not judging. It's just our, how our personalities are. And that's my personality. I'm more of a one-off person that likes to deal with things and really dig deep. Being, I'm a very focused person on one thing. I'm not a, a social butterfly type person. So, you know, that plus being animation does make Lower Decks little hard for me to follow, but we're very new. I mean, as of right now, we've only had, what, four episodes, so, yeah. And I do remember the original TAS, the original animated series. And, you know, when you go to a 30-minute format or 25 minutes and still want to tell a complete story, you're going to have to have a faster pace, and I get that. I really do. I'm, I am happy that people are happy with uh, Lower Decks. Of course, some people aren't, but those people aren't going to be happy with anything. And that's maybe a final point to talk about, taking myself out of the equation. I'm really tired of the political lines, the agenda lines. It's like if you're in this camp, the left, you're going to just gushingly love this set of television, films, what have you. And if you're in this camp, the right, we'll call it for lack of anything better. And don't get me wrong, I'm just, we can even call them Camp Y and Camp Z, whatever you want to do. You know, the, the two camps. And, the, and then you like these films, television shows, and you hate the others. You know, you saw that with, with so much stuff. And I got so tired of the, the channels that I knew would just love any new Star Wars. And they would just... Or Star Trek, Discovery, what have you. And they would just heap praise upon praise. It was like saccharine sweet. It was like eating way too much candy. And I knew they'd never point out any of the faults. Flip side, the other group of channels out there that... They're going to just hate it, Period. They're not going to give it a chance. They'll even sometimes admit they never watched it and then pick it apart regardless, based on teasers or preconceptions, what have you. 
And that's just boring, because at that point, it's not even a review. It's just people bitching. And because it's, it becomes less about the media, the entertainment, the product even, than it does just pushing their agenda. And, and, and that gets dull. A review should at least have the attempt to be objective. First off, actually see the content. Second, think about it. Try to s separate yourself as best you can from it. I'm not saying completely divorce because... Yeah, but, you know, honestly, that used to be the old school ideal, to try to do it. I'm not saying people have succeeded, but they tried to do. But, um, that's not how it goes anymore, and I think most of you get it. It's just, if you want to like it, you're going to tune in to channels that are going to tell you to just love it un in unconditionally and if you want to hate it if you want to feel outraged you'll tune, tune into that and it, it's confirmation biased and we see this with news today too if you're in camp Y you'll tune into Fox if you're in camp Z you'll tune into CNN or whatever not because you sincerely want the news but because you just want to confirm what you've already decided in your mind and that's bothersome to me as someone who used to be an educator and still really does value that why are people so threatened so challenged by the idea of being threatened and challenged so what if you learn new data that might change your mind isn't that good isn't it better to know facts than just to be right to me it is to me, I don't mind changing my opinion, changing my mind, learning new things, or even meeting people that have alternative points of view and having a lively discussion, but also respecting them and hopefully them respecting me at the end of the day. Going, well, we don't have the same opinion, but we both have well-reasoned, well-thought-out opinions, so we can respect, if not agree. And I don't, I don't know. And that's one of the things that bugs me. Are, are, let's just face it. Most people get their news from YouTube or other sources, social media type sources today, are the places that knowingly, intentionally either twist the truth or just totally ignore it and make up shit. I hate intellectual dishonesty. That's just kind of the antithesis of the, the person I at least would like to be. The truth, it's not subjective. It's not opinion. Now, knowing the truth, finding the truth, that's the hard. There is truth, but it's not simple. And I think that's what people want, is they want something boiled down to be simple. And unfortunately, life um, doesn't oblige us like that. It's not black and white. And I think that's another thing with a lot of new Star Trek. It's, it's become simplified. It's, it's missing a lot of that gray, that nuance. Um, don't know. It's just... Some of it is just changing times. And that I can understand. But when it's more agenda-driven and either on screen or off screen on either side camp Y, camp Z camp left, camp right whenever that agenda whenever the politics matters more this is entertainment this isn't education nor should it be I, I don't and I know most of you know this this is self evident stuff this isn't earth-shattering. It always amazes me, the people that really care what this or that Hollywood celebrity says or thinks, or worse yet, votes for. I could give two shits about what someone in California votes. I really don't care. You know the funny thing about a lot of actors, not everyone, but a lot of them, what makes them such good actors, what lets them fit themselves into roles, 
become different people is the fact that they themselves have a pretty blank personality. Blank slate. A.K.A. they're not very deep people. <laughs> you know what I mean? And again, not saying everyone, so yeah. But a lot of them, they're just, I don't know. They're not, they're not intellectuals. They're actors. They're not doctors. They're not lawyers. They're, they're not professors. They're not engineers. They're not pilots. Oh, they're actors. Please keep that in mind. <sighs> so, I don't know. Kind of with that, I'll probably wrap things up. I'm finally getting tired. <laughs> I, I just, I wonder. Let me wonder. It's a strange, strange world sometimes. I just thought it might be interesting to some of you, my perspective and how I consume media. If it's not, I, you, you've clicked off long ago, but, you know, it is what it is. And the reason I say that is me, myself, and I personally, I enjoy hearing other people's life experiences, especially people very different from me. I like hearing about how their lives are lived out there. I, I love that. I don't want to be surrounded by people like myself. I don't want to be surrounded by people that are different from me. I mean, my wife was born literally half a world away from me. Uh, I just, I like that. So I thought this might be something of interest to someone out there. If you have any questions, things I didn't address, feel free to put them in the comments and um, I can always do another video. These cost me nothing to make and cost you nothing but time to listen to. So with that, I do appreciate you hanging out with me and help me getting tired before bed. I have to get up early in the morning for a meeting. But uh, yeah, not hating on the stuff and I recognize that a lot of my problems with uh, new media are specific to me. It still doesn't change the fact that I'm a human being and I miss stuff I can consume easily and enjoy easily. And I could do that with the original series, the original Star Wars films, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine. I have a harder time doing it with new stuff. And the new Star Wars film, what was it, Rise of Skywalker or whatever? Forget about it. That That's that's something I could never... It, the, it, the, yeah, it, it's, it's an insane pace with just... I mean, is there even dialogue in that film? I wonder if you added up all the dialogue in the film of its runtime, how much was actually spoken. I can promise you it's not as much as you'd think. If people enjoyed the visuals, cool. Good on them. Cool, cool, cool. But for me, myself, and I, nope. Not not, not for me. Not for me at all. Um, I'll go rewatch Battlestar Galactica. Um, one of the films I liked that came out years ago, I liked Interstellar. That was, that was a good one. Pretty, very 2001-esque. Um, I do enjoy a lot of media. Not not all of it, even from the 80s when I was a kid. There is newer stuff I, I do enjoy. But that's probably a topic for another day. Things that I do appreciate and like. Well, with that, I hope everyone's having a good one. And um, if you could, like, share, and subscribe. And I'll be back again sometime with um, <laughs> with something. This is Misha, and I'll catch you next time.